And David's heart was that which thirsted after God. His heart was that which was hungry uh, for the things of God and desired to know God in a more intimate way. Uh, we see as he states in this, he says, first of all, and acknowledges God, you are my God and I will seek you. I will, I will go after you. I will run after you. I will uh, seek to know you uh, in a more intimate way. And then he goes on, he says, my flesh longs for you as in a dry and thirsty land. And it goes on and mentions a lot of different things pertaining to that. And as I read that verse, those verses, I, I thought of so many believers today. In fact, I thought of some of you in this congregation. And I thought to myself, you know, uh, there are many in this congregation who have felt uh, that they were in a dry and a thirsty land. I have felt that there are many in this congregation uh, who have been battered, who have been uh, uh, going through all sorts of trials, all sorts of tribulations. Uh, they, at one time, uh, they were on fire for God. At one time, they loved the Word of God. At one time, uh, they couldn't get enough of church and the people of God, and, and they came into the body of Christ or into the family of God uh, with great optimism and with great excitement, uh, but then life happened. And, and when life happened, uh, they found out that just because a person is saved doesn't mean they always act saved. Amen. That includes you too, right? Amen. Is everybody with me? Uh, they found out that just because we're in church and, and we worship a living Savior, a Savior who's alive, a Savior who's perfect in every way, that doesn't mean those who are Christians are perfect. Uh, no, thank God. We're not perfect, but we're on our way. We're, we're growing, I trust, in Jesus' name. Amen. And so through a variety of things, you know, we enter into this, uh, this Christian life, uh, perhaps, I pray anyway, excited, on fire, desiring more of God, wanting to know God, uh, you know, in many ways, just almost, uh, uh, you know, just kind of naive sometimes thinking, well, I'm around these Christian people, these Christian people are going to always be nice, they're always going to be Christ-like and all of this, and then we get damaged, we get uh, going through things and, and whatever, and we begin to think, you know what, I don't need church anymore, I don't need this uh, hassle, I don't need all this trouble anymore and eventually they enter in uh, to this dry and thirsty land. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? And, and you know I've been there. I know. I, you know being a pastor does not make you immune to these things. I, I've, I've, uh, I've had to put up with a lot of things. I've had to deal with a lot of issues, a lot of uh, situations. I've had people cuss at me. I've had all sorts of things. Christian, Christian people. Christian people. No. All right. yeah. At least they said they were. All right. You understand. You understand what I'm talking about here. Amen? We're just getting real here. But then, with all of that in mind, I want you to look at Psalm 85. Psalm 85. This is a psalm of the sons of Korah, but still inspired by the Spirit of God. Notice what it says, beginning with verse 4. Are you there? Psalm 85, verse 4. The rest of you, if you're there, say yes. yes. All right, Psalm 85 and verse 4. Notice the two words, the first words. Restore us. Everybody say, restore us. And then it goes on, restore us, O God of our salvation, and cause your anger toward us to cease. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your mercy, Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people and to his saints. But let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land, that glory may dwell in our land. And so as I pondered on these things, I, I, I had this word just kind of reverberating in my heart and in my mind, uh, this word restore. This word restore. I believe God wants to restore us. I believe God wants to revive us. I believe God, in spite of all that we might have been through, in spite of all the junk that we might have experienced, I want you to know uh, that God is in the restoration business today. Today. He wants to bring back that joy of your salvation. You remember David saying in Psalm 51, some of you might be familiar with that Psalm, Psalm 51, a, a, a Davidic Psalm, and it really the, 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 the background of that Psalm is that he had committed adultery with Bathsheba and he had killed indirectly Uriah, her husband. And David now in that Psalm 51, is it's a Psalm of repentance. And one of the things that he does, he confesses his sin, and one of the things that he says in that is he says, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. 
How many of you know sin will steal your joy? Amen? As far as it coming up out of you and you walking in that joy of the Lord. And I thought about that and, and considered that and I thought to myself, you know, there's a lot of believers just don't seem to have much joy operating in their lives. Did you know a revived people is a joyous people? And it's not dependent upon uh, the circumstances. It's not dependent upon the things going on around you. It's a joy that's inexpressible and full of glory that Jesus has placed in our hearts when we accepted him as our Lord and Savior. Amen? And so David said, Restore to me the joy of your salvation, Lord. And again, I'm saying this uh, not just about joy, but about whatever area it is. Whatever area of our lives, he's a restoring kind of God. And you know, I was looking at this, and we had the PowerPoint. We'd be able to show this a little bit better. But you know, this country was really uh, founded upon, or at least it was greatly influenced by the First Great Awakening. And the first great awakening, many believe, began with Jonathan Edwards. And Jonathan Edwards, one day, uh, who I understand historically was a very boring preacher, by the way, and, and yet, you know, very, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? What's the word? Monotone. Yeah, very monotone and not very exciting. One thing, you may not like my preaching, but one thing you could never say is I am not monotone. Amen? All right. And so, uh, but he was very monotone. But one day he got up there and he began uh, to preach about, and you know the title of the message probably. You've heard this as one of the famous messages ever, is Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Now, I dare say to you that if we put that on our website, coming up next week, a new series entitled uh, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Most people wouldn't come here today. Isn't that right? Is everybody with me here today? And, uh, and so, you know, he began that. And, and, and man, by the time it was all said and done, the people, some of them were weeping. They were repenting. Uh, they were turning toward God. And, and God began to move. And many believe that was the beginning of the first uh, great awakening. And you know I'm not going to take time to drink that. I don't know why you're bringing it to me. But anyway, I don't take a breath. Uh, I don't take a breath long enough to take a drink. Anyway. But in any case, uh, that was the beginning of that first great awakening. And many are convinced, and I think it's very apparent, that that first great awakening had great influence in the founding of our nation. God moved in such a mighty way in those years preceding 1776. I mean, there were preachers that rose up like George Whitfield. And, and you know, I'm not saying all their doctrine was right, but man, they could preach the gospel. They could get people saved. George Whitfield, you know, he was one of, with, with John Wesley, a friend. John Wesley, of course, founded basically, he and Charles, his brother, the Methodist Church, right? And, and, but Whitfield was involved with that as well. George Whitfield was a powerful preacher. And they discovered, you know, uh, you know, in a way that they never would have imagined. Uh, because, uh, first of all, with John Wesley, one day he was preaching, and they went and they kicked him out of the church. They didn't like what he was preaching. So, you know, in those days, he, uh, you know, they, they, uh, they had, the, and you see it here, they had the graveyards on church grounds. Isn't that right? I'm not sure what the thinking was on that. Uh, but nevertheless, I guess... I guess uh, to stay close to the church. I, I don't know why. Uh, but anyway, all the cemeteries, many of the cemeteries were right on the church grounds and everything like that. So John Wesley, they kicked him out of the building. And so he went and he stood on his father's gravestone and he preached. And God moved in a mighty way. And it, it was a, like a new revelation. You mean to tell me I don't have to be in the church building for God to move? And so they began having these open air meetings. And they realized that God can move not just inside a building, God can move anywhere. Isn't that right? I know that seems like a, a no-brainer to you and me, but that's something they didn't have a revelation of. And so then, of course, his friend Whitfield, he was known for open-air meetings. He came here and he was preaching. There were times uh, when, uh, you know, they were Anglican, you know, the uh, British uh, version of Episcopalian in a way uh, at that time. And, and so, you know, they were, uh, they were doing all sorts of things. And Whitfield, before he would preach... He would tell because people, especially the young people, uh, boys and whatever, they'd get up in the trees so they could see him better. They'd get up in the trees so they could see him better. But before he would start preaching, he'd say, boys, you need to come down out of the trees. Because when I begin preaching, the power of God sometimes gets so strong, people fall out of the trees. And from that distance, you could get hurt. 
And so he had to make them get out of the tree because people were falling under the power. Now, I would submit to you that if it really is the power of God, they're not going to get hurt. But nevertheless, he was a cautious man. Amen? But God moved mightily, is my point. And, and Whitfield became a great friend of Benjamin Franklin. And, and Benjamin Franklin was greatly influenced by him. Benjamin Franklin was probably the most uh, liberal and, and non-orthodox individual of all the founding fathers. However, uh, compared to liberals today, he would have been considered a, a, a mega conservative. And, uh, and uh, I think he became a Christian. He was a deist at one point, but uh, some of the later writings in his later life when he was about 80, 81 years old, it sounded like he was a believer in Jesus Christ. And I'm sure George Whitfield had a great part in that. Amen? Amen. Amen. But my point is this. Our nation needs another great awakening. Our nation needs a great awakening, another mighty move of God. And it's going to take preachers that are not going to compromise. It's going to take preachers that will still talk about sin, that will still talk about repentance, that will still talk about the realities of hell as well as the realities of heaven. It's going to take people that are not going to, uh, you know, bow uh, to Nebuchadnezzar, so to speak, right, and, and be willing to uh, compromise and, and uh, be willing to do this in order to even save their potential lives or whatever the case may be. It's going to take people. Uh, that are going to speak the truth in love, speak it in love, but speak it firmly and boldly and without shame and stand strong for the word of God and the power of God is going to move in a mighty way. As God's people repent, people will get fresh fire in their hearts and they'll begin to want to win the lost as well. Amen? And so my message, I don't know, I, I put this message a cry for another great awakening. That's my cry. Is that your cry? The cry for another great awakening, awakening, another great move of God, of, people, uh, of the people of God first repenting. And, and God moving in a mighty and powerful way. God's power showing up. In recent days, I've been talking about uh, divine healing and, uh, and revival and oh, how we need uh, God to show up and heal bodies and, and show the world that Jesus really is still alive. He rose from the dead. He's still the healer and the deliverer and the miracle worker today. Amen? The same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? Are you with me here today? And so everybody say, Restore. He wants to restore us. He wants to restore you. He wants to restore you to that place that you were in terms of loving the Word of God, in terms of loving God, in terms of uh, desiring the Spirit of God to move in your life, to desire the gifts of the Spirit, uh, to desire uh, just any and everything that God has for you. Amen? You know, a, a scripture that was, it's been my life scripture. You mind if I share it with you? Jeremiah chapter 15, if you don't mind going there. I don't hear those pages flipping, so hopefully you're pushing buttons or something. But uh, Jeremiah chapter 15, are you, are you doing that? Yeah. It's a good scripture. You need it. And, and you know what? You need to underline it and highlight it and all this. Jeremiah, you know, Jeremiah was a great prophet of God. God used him in a mighty way. He's called the weeping prophet uh, because he, he did go and, and the spirit of God moved in his life and he wept over, over Judah and, and really uh, was concerned about their well-being and what have you. But you'll notice here in Jeremiah 15, and you know, sometimes people talk about a life verse and I, I don't know, that's not necessarily a, a thing you have to do, uh, but I read this one day years ago and I thought, that's my life verse, that, that's me right there. And I'm not trying to compare myself to Jeremiah, but we all should have this heart. Amen. Notice what Jeremiah said, because he tried not to preach. He tried to avoid it. He didn't want to go through the persecution and all the other things. And he, he claimed, I'm too young and all of that. And, and I don't know enough. And, and yet when he tried not to speak, it says this. Jeremiah said in verse 16, your words were found and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. For I'm called by your name, O Lord God of, of, the, of hosts. And so he said, God, I found your word and I ate your word and your word became to me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. And you know what? I'll tell you those many years ago when I was 17 years of age and I began to go to a Bible church, uh, that was my heart. I found out what the Word of God had to say about who Jesus was, about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and I found out who I was in Christ and found out uh, that I could do whatever He called me to do. I could do whatever He said because I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength and so can you. Amen? 
Is everybody with me here? And I began to have the Bible opened up to me to a greater degree and I just fell in love with the Scripture and it became the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. And I don't know about you, I don't ever want to lose that. But yet there have been times in my life that I've gone through a dry and a thirsty land. I've gone through things in my life as well uh, that have caused me to say, I don't want to preach anymore. I want to go back. I, I, I think I should go back to, I, I remember back in my 20s, I'm going to go back and go to forestry school. I, I'm just going to go back to forestry school. Kind of like Israel when they left Egypt. They, they got out there in the wilderness and they had some suffering. They said, let's go back to Egypt. How many of you know that for Christians, there's no going back? There's no going back. There's nothing worth going back to. Isn't that right? Yes. Nothing worth going back to. And so again, everybody say restore. restore. Some of you have had times in your life when the word of God was the joy and the rejoicing of your heart. And it's like you couldn't get enough of it. And you love the word of God. You love coming to church. You love the people of God. You loved all these things. Uh, but some things have happened. I want, I believe and I want you to know that God wants to restore to you the joy and rejoicing of your heart found in God's word. Amen. Amen. I'm excited about this, even if you're not. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, let's go over here to the book of Joel. J-O-E-L. Joel. You know, one of, the, uh, in one of the things that's important for us to understand is that, uh, is that many of the prophets spoke of restoration. Many of the prophets spoke of restoration, and in the context of it, many of it had to do with Judah and, uh, you know, after the, the captivity in Babylon and all the things that they endured. And, and, and Joel is one of those who talked of restoration. In fact, once you find Joel, uh, uh, chapter 2, I want you to hold your place there, and, and, uh, and you can put, you know, that's what these ribbons are for. If you've got a, if you've got a you know, an electronic one, you don't have a ribbon, uh, but you have other ways, maybe. Uh, but once you find Joel, I want you to go over to Acts chapter 3 for a moment, if you don't mind. Everybody say restore. restore. How about this? How about what the psalmist said? Restore us. How about you? I want him to restore us. I'll tell you, I just get so tired uh, of trying to just stir people up and, and try to get them excited about God and excited about being here and all that. And sometimes I think to myself, God, is this really, is this really worth it? And then God reminds me it's worth it because we are the sons and daughters of God and God wants to have a great awakening. It's his plan for us to have another great awakening. I'm convinced of that. This isn't something that we just want. This is something God wants. Don't you think God wants that? In Acts chapter 3, of course, the background of this is Peter and John. You know, they had uh, uh, brought healing to a man. Jesus did through them and all these things. And Peter began to preach a bunch of things about the gospel, about Jesus. And then it comes here to save time. Uh, you remember, in fact, a couple of weeks ago, I, I, I read to you verse 16. So why don't we start there? Because a couple of weeks ago, we kind of diverted from my notes completely, as I'm kind of doing today. And we diverted from the notes completely, and we talked about the power of the name of Jesus. And we talked about this particular verse, amongst other things, in verse 16 of Acts chapter 3. Are you there? And it says, as they're explaining, Peter, uh, Peter at this point is explaining what had happened. It says this in verse 60, And this name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now notice, now again, a great miracle. This miracle, this lame man made whole, who hadn't walked from the day he was born. And now a group, a, a multitude of people gathered together because a man was made whole. How many of you know healing becomes the calling card for people to hear the gospel? Many, many times, doesn't it? And then notice in verse 17, Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But those things which God foretold, now note now, verse 18, starting with this, now note this. But, the, but those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, everybody say all his prophets, that the Christ would suffer he has thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before whom heaven must receive. The idea is there to retain. In other words, he's not coming yet. 
And so he says, whom heaven must retain until the times of restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. And so again, restoration. It says that Christ will be retained in heaven until the restoration of all things that the prophets have foretold. Now, there's a lot of things pertaining to that, and I can't claim to understand all the things about that, but my point is this, uh, that there is promise to you and me times of restoration. There is promise to you and me times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. The idea of seasons of refreshing. I look at some of you sometimes, and I know. I don't even have to have the Holy Spirit reveal. I don't need a word of knowledge. I know by looking at you, you need a, a refreshing from the presence of God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And so he says to these people that he's preaching to, but it applies to you and me, it's prophetically said. He said uh, that the prophets have foretold that there would be times of refreshing and times of restoration. And let's believe God that's happening now and will continue to happen and it's going to happen here because God wants to restore you today. He wants to restore in you a love for His Word. He wants to restore in you a love for prayer. He wants to restore in you a love for worship. He wants to restore in you a love for your fellow believers and a love for the lost. He wants to restore in you healing if you're sick. Restore in you deliverance if you're bound. Restoring you whatever it is that the enemy has stolen from you. He wants to restore. Can you say amen? amen? And so as we look back now to Joel, the prophet Joel. Remember all the prophets. Joel's one of those prophets. And there's a lot of things about Joel. I did a study of Joel a long time ago, but, you know, this is a, a post-exile prophet, you know, after the exile of Babylon, and some things are being said here pertaining to Judah. He's a prophet to Judah. And so a lot of things being said, but let's apply it and see how it applies to you and me today. Remembering, remembering this. Notice here, it says, in Joel 2, at the very end, it says in verse 28, we're going to go back to more of the beginning of this chapter in a minute, but I want to point something out to you. It says in verse 28, notice, are you there? Yeah. It says, it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit. In those days, I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the, and the moon into, uh, into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And, and my point is this, that a portion of this from verses 28 and 29 is quoted by Peter on the day of Pentecost when they're asking him after they had been filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke with other tongues and people from all different nations said, what is this that we're experiencing and seeing? He quotes from Joel 2, 28 and 29 and said, this is the fulfillment. This is that which the prophet Joel said, that in that day, in the last day, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And so Peter was led by the Spirit of God to apply that portion of Joel to the new covenant of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Now, there's other things, though, that apply because they are biblical principles. Notice as we go back here in chapter 2. Is everybody with me? Now, notice now, it says a lot of different things, and many people uh, debate as to what this really is referring to in some cases, but it, it talks about uh, an army. It talks about an army coming before uh, Judah, or coming against Judah, and there's no real record, as I understand it, of an actual army coming against Judah, maybe because they repented, which we'll read about as well. It was thwarted one way or the other, but they had gone into sin. Judah, again, had gone into sin. How many of you know that Judah and Israel had gone into sin many, many different times, and when they went into sin, they opened themselves up to attacks from enemies. Isn't that right? And, and I wouldn't even say that uh, God sent the enemies per se, but what I would say, now maybe, but I would say more like this, that when Israel or Judah came into sin and would not repent, God removed his staying hand and their protection was no longer there. So the enemies could come in and God used the enemies of Israel and Judah in order to bring Israel and Judah to places of repentance. And you know, many times that happens, unfortunately, for the believer in the new covenant as well. That trials, tribulations, things like that, many times if we are away from God, if we have backslid away from God, it's those very things that bring us to a place of repentance as well. Isn't that right? 
And why is that? I think it's something about this human nature of ours uh, that many times, you know, if we give into the flesh and sin and don't repent, uh, God goes to drastic measures in order so that we might realize we need God in our lives because apparently when we backslide into sin, we've reached some kind of point in our lives where we think we don't need God anymore. Does this make sense to you? And so you'll notice here it says, and we're going to have to just, uh, we won't start at the very beginning because of time. But you'll notice it says, beginning with verse, uh, let's start with, uh, I don't know where to start, verse 1. Let's start with verse 1, all right, of chapter 2. It says, blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand. A day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like the morning clouds spread over the mountains. A people come great and strong, the like of whom has never been, nor will there ever be any such after them. For uh, even for many successive generations, a fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Surely nothing shall escape them. Let me just stop here for a second. Sometimes uh, uh, expositors believe that this is a locust invasion, and I think that there is an element of that in chapter one, a definite literal locust invasion, but there seems to be a turning point where we got some symbolism and, and some uh, figurative language here where it goes from being a locust invasion in chapter one to perhaps an actual army of, of individuals uh, that are attacking or prophesied to attack Judah uh, in the future. And so as it goes on with this, it says, it says in verse four, their appearance on is like the appearance of horses and like swift steeds, so they run. With a noise like chariots over mountaintops, they leap. Like the noise of the flaming fire that devours the stubble, like a strong people set in battle array. Before them, the people writhe in pain. All faces are drained of color. They run like mighty men. They climb the wall like men of war. Everyone marches in formation and they do not break ranks. They do not push one another. Everyone marches in his own column, etc., etc., and talks about all sorts of things describing this army. Now notice in verse 10, the earthquakes before them and the heavens tremble. The sun and moon grow dark and the stars diminish their brightness. The Lord gives voice before his army, his army. And I would take that as being God allowing this to happen because Judah needs to repent. And again, there's other uh, applications to this, no doubt about the end times as well, because the day of the Lord usually is referring uh, to the coming of the Lord. Uh, there's probably some application to that as well, but let's apply it uh, to where we're at because there's application here. There's always one interpretation, and this is a little, this is difficult to interpret exactly, but there's several applications that can be made here. And so he goes on, and he says in, in, in uh, uh, verse uh, Verse 11, the Lord gives voice before his army for his camp is very great. For strong is the one who executes his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? Verse 12, now therefore says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart. Turn to me with all your heart with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return. Everybody say return. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he, re he re relents from doing harm. Now, I just want to stop there for a moment here, because you know what? When we've lost, when we've lost uh, that fervor, when we've gotten away from uh, this uh, uh, desire for God, this love for his word, uh, when we've been battered or beaten or backslid or whatever it might be. And, and you know, there's different forms of backsliding, isn't there? I mean, sometimes when we think of backslidden, we think of somebody that might have just totally gone out in the world, and now they're partying and drugging and drinking and all that. We think that's backslidden. But I would submit to you this, that there could be people that go to church every Sunday and they go through all the motions, but because they're not where they once were in their relationship with God, they are essentially backslid. Are you understand what I'm saying to you? Amen. Are you hearing me here today? I mean, you might be backslid today, and I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. I wouldn't do that to you. But, you know, you might be backslid here today uh, because, you know what, again, you're not where you once were in your relationship with God. But that's wonderful. I'm glad you're here because coming here is part of getting to that place where that relationship is being rebuilt again and, and all of that. Amen? Uh, somebody said, well, I'm not going to go to church because if I go to church, I'll feel like a hypocrite because of what I've been all week and whatever. No, 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 wait a minute. If you're born again, you are not being a hypocrite when you're doing things out there that are not Christ-like. Or, or, or excuse me. You are not being a hypocrite. Let me say it there. Everybody, everybody ready? All right. 
You are being a hypocrite as a believer when you're out there doing things like drinking or, or whatever, or not acting Christ-like out there. You are being a hypocrite, but you are never being a hypocrite when you're being and doing that which Christians do. Did you follow me on that? In other words, it's not this, I'm not going to go to church because if I go to church, I'm going to be like a hypocrite because of the way I've been living out there. No, when you were living out there, you were being the hypocrite. When you come to church, you're being a Christian. And that's not being a hypocrite because that's what you are. When you come to church, you're being what you are if you're a Christian. Isn't that right? And so never be thinking and allow the enemy to steal from you and say, I'm not going to go to church because I've been a hypocrite all week. No, no, come to church and stop being a hypocrite because this is what you are. Does that make sense to you today? Even though I messed it up in the beginning, it makes sense, right? Yeah. Amen. All right, so I'm going to get back to this. Everybody's with me. You're awake, right? You can't go to sleep when I preach. You might want to, but I'm watching you. All right, amen. All right. It's good to have fun in church as well. Amen. And so he goes on and he says again, turn to me with all your heart. Why? Because the enemies come in. Because things have happened. Because you're not where you ought to be in your relationship with God. He says, turn with me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for He's gracious. Aren't you glad He's gracious? And He's merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and He relents from doing harm. Who knows if He will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind Him, a grain offering, a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children in nursing bays. Let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. Let the priests who minister uh, to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach. What's all this? This is all description of true heart repentance. It's all description of turning to God, turning away from the direction we were going. Turning away from the apathy, turning away from the lukewarmness, turning away uh, from wherever we have fallen from or fallen to and turning back toward God. Now notice, I'm going to skip some verses to save us time, but notice what it says in verse 23. He says, be glad then, you children of Zion. By the way, in Hebrews... I believe it's in chapter 12, speaking to the church, it says, You have come unto Mount Zion, and unto the heavenly Jerusalem, and unto an innumerable company of angels, unto the church, unto the church of the living God. And so Zion is a picture of the church. And so as he goes on, he says this, And so be glad, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain uh, to come down for you, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. What is he talking about? He's talking about an outpouring. He's talking about forget about real rain. We've had enough rain, Lord. Uh, we're not talking about real rain. We're talking about an outpouring of the Spirit of God. Amen? And the former and the latter rain coming together. And so he says, the former and the latter is coming. The threshing floor shall be full of wheat and the vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. Uh, wine, wine and oil many times picked, uh, depict or are figurative of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that right? Then notice he says, so I, verse 25, so I will what? I will restore. I will restore. Repentance precedes restoration. They repented, and when they repented, God poured out. And when God poured out, He restored. And God wants to restore us today. He wants to restore you today to wherever it is that you once were, and even beyond that, even perhaps even a greater relationship with God. Wouldn't you think God always wants things greater in terms of our relationship with Him? Amen? Amen. And He says, so I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, all these different kinds of locusts. But the point is this. The point is this. Anything the enemy has stolen from you that was from God, he wants to restore. If God gave it to start with and the enemy has stolen, if he's stolen your joy, if he's stolen your peace, if he's stolen your health, uh, if he's stolen your relationships, God wants to restore what the enemy has stolen. I'm more excited than you are, but that's all right. Because, you know, really, I want this to settle down anyway, and it really isn't how you outwardly uh, express or respond. It's what's happening on the inside of each and every one of us. Amen? It's what's happening on the inside. God wants to restore us. And he goes on and he says in verse 26, You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. God wants to deal wondrously 
with us as we turn to Him with all of our hearts. And I know, I know and I understand that life happens. I understand that hurts take place. I understand that all sorts of things, you know, you know, I'm not a youngster anymore, and I've lived plenty of life now. Not plenty, Lord. i got a lot more to go. i got a good 30 years left in me. Amen? 30 years. Maybe even more. 30 makes me 86. Ah, let's go for further. Amen? All right. Let's make it 50 more. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Uh, but anyway, I've got a lot of life left in me. And, and, and you know what? Uh, uh, even though I do, I've lived enough now to know that there's things that happen and battering and, and, and offenses and, and all this kind of thing can have tribulation, whatever, and it can do wounds in our hearts. But you know what? We've got to learn to let those things go. We've got to learn that those things held within will not help us. They'll only hurt us. We've got to learn that those things uh, will never allow us to get back in our fellowship with God and our excitement for the things of God. Once again, we've got to say, God, help me let go of these things. Help me turn to you with all my heart and turn away from these things uh, that have hurt me, that have broken my heart, that have wounded me, uh, that have caused me to be drained, that have caused me to be in a dry and thirsty land. Help me let go of these things so that I can go on with you and receive a time of restoration and refreshing from your presence. And and be on fire. Your prayer should be, I, I hope that it is, your prayer should be, God, restore to me any and everything I've lost. Restore to me the love I've had for you. Restore to me the love I've had for your word. Restore to me the love I've had for your church. Restore to me the love and, and the enthusiasm and the fire and the zeal that I once had. Restore it to me and let it even go beyond that, Lord. I want to be everything you want me to be. You know, it should never stop being the case. You know, when we were first Christians, many times we said, to God, God, I want to be everything you want me to be. And then things happen and maybe we backed off on that. But you know what? It ought to always be our prayer. God, I want to be everything that you want me to be so that I might be a blessing. I remember years ago, I'm going to be done in a minute. We're going to pray for people. But I remember years ago, a fellow came to me and, you know, he was, uh, he, I, I think he's a real Christian. I'd known him for years. But he came to me and he said, he said, I want to ask you a question. He says, Church, why? You say, church, why? In other words, what's the point? What's the point? Well, you know, my answer then wasn't as good as it would be now. I'm waiting for somebody to ask me that question now. But that, the answer to me was, to him at that point, my answer was, well, because God said so. God said to gather together. God said assemble together. And, you know, really for a Christian, that should be enough. It really should be enough. But on the other hand, there's some other reasons why. Because you know what? His viewpoint was, why should I come to church? I'm not getting what I need. Or, you know, I, I don't need other people. I don't need this, that, or the other thing. Why should I come to church? I can get the word on television. I can get the word on radio. Let me tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because you have giftings. You have abilities that you can add and you can bless other people with. And that we were never meant to go it alone. We were never meant to be TV Christians. Or internet Christians. Nothing wrong with those things as a supplement. But let me tell you something, folks. There's something about being together. You'll never grow that way like you'll grow if you assemble with other believers. You remember when you first got married? And it's probably still part of your life. I'm sure it is. When you first got married, I mean, everything changed. I mean, you know, Pam and I, we were older when we got married. We were an older, almost 29. And our son was born when we were 38. Isn't that something? She was 38. Anyway... But, uh, but, you know, we were older. And, and so uh, I had a point to that, and I can't remember what it was because I was concentrating on your age. Uh, but what was that? Was that? <laughs> and I really did have a good point, and uh, it'll come back to me as we keep on going here. You know, you remember when you first got married, you know, you might have been set in your ways. And that was the point. We were older, and so we were probably even more set in our ways, right? And we had certain ways of doing things and whatever. But how many of you know when you get married, you have a prime opportunity to grow like you've never grown before? Isn't that right? Why? Because when you're living by yourself or whatever, man, you don't care. It doesn't matter if you clean the dishes when you uh, want, want to or not. Or it doesn't matter if you pick up your underwear or whatever the case may be when you live by yourself. I mean, you're pretty free. Isn't that right? But when you live with somebody else, now there's responsibility. Now there's opportunity for growth. Now you don't just watch on TV what you want to watch on TV. You don't eat when you want to eat. You want to uh, work together and, and you, you join together. You merge together. And now it's a time of growth, isn't it? Same thing with church. As we gather together, we're around one another. 
and we grow more that way because we learn how to adapt. We learn how to grow together. We learn how to love those that maybe we wouldn't love normally because God enables us. God, sometimes he puts all of us, he makes all of us different. He makes us all different and then puts us together and says, now you get along. And he gives us all these weird parts of us. How many of you know everybody's got a little bit of weird? Everybody but me. <laughs> Am I wrong? Okay. Anyway, uh, but we all have a little bit of weird. We have idiosyncrasies and all these things. And God puts us together and says, now you get along. And you know what that does? That helps us to grow, doesn't it? Helps us to grow. But we all have giftings, abilities, even if it's an encouraging word. Do you know what encourages me just if you come to church? Can you imagine that? Just a minute. It just blesses me. It encourages me that somebody's here on Sunday mornings. Because it would be really boring without you for one thing. Amen? And, and I work hard to try to get the right word for you and whatever. And I know it's summertime and everything like that. But nevertheless, it blesses me just to have you here. But also, us growing together, learning together, community together. We want to do more things together. Everybody say restore. restore. God wants to restore us. God wants to restore us. Oh, yeah, you put drink on there. You see, you're not supposed to do that tea on there. God wants to restore us, and we want to just be able to minister to people today. Let's believe God for uh, just powerful prayer and that God is going to fill us up again because there's many fillings, isn't there? Amen? Amen. So I'd like the worship team to come. If you've been blessed by this message today, please prayerfully consider giving to help support the ministry of Abounding Grace Christian Church. No gift is too small, and we'll agree with you in prayer that God will continue to bless you richly for your support. If you'd like to give online, go to agcc.church. The link is found below, and look for the green tab near the top that says Give Online. Or you can send your gift by mail to the address also below. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos coming in the future. And thank you so much, and God bless. Let's go.